Before we get started, uh, I remember last year when we did the Galatians class. And I said that I was going to put that stuff together in a book and stuff like that and be able to uh, distribute the notes. Well, the book is done. Okay? 100, 150 pages, uh, Understanding Galatians. It's got um, uh, front to back, uh, color, front cover, back cover. If you're interested in those, uh, I think they're going to be like $10. Okay? Yeah. You want to offer the audio disc with that too? Um, is it ready? Well, except for that one that I had to go back and find, and I haven't been able to find it yet. It's ready. More information to come on the audio disc. Okay? But uh, the, the annotated notes are ready. I'll have, if you want to look at them, I'll have them out um, when we're done with class. So, two weeks ago, when the last study, we finished up the uh, time period of the Middle Ages. Okay, We looked at John Huss and the Bohemian Brethren. And I told you that when we came back after uh, I was gone for a week that we were going to look at um, the Renaissance and how the Renaissance sets up or paves the way for the Reformation. And that's what we're going to look at today in Lesson, lesson 29. Okay. Now, I don't know how much you remember from your high school world history class. Some of you probably more than others. If you like history, possibly you've been reading or have read about some of these things uh, on your own. But we're going to look at the Renaissance and, and specifically how it uh, sets up for the Reformation. Okay, during the Middle Ages, uh, during the Middle Ages, Europe suffered from both. And why is this out of order? This cannot. I did this uh, very little sleep. During the Middle Ages, Europe suffered from both war and plague. Those who survived wanted to celebrate life in the human spirit. They began to question institutions of the Middle Ages which had been unable to prevent war or relief the suffering brought on by the plague. Now, how many know what I mean by the plague? I'm talking about the Black Death, okay? Bubonic plague uh, killed one-third of the population of Europe as, as it spread through. Uh, various interesting theories are out there as far as the, the plague is believed to have originated in China and that it was spread, the, the traditional theory is that it was spread into Europe through uh, the, uh, rats who came in uh, on merchant vessels into ports in Italy. Uh, there's, an, uh, there's new research on this stuff that indicates that the Mongols contracted, communicated the plague into Europe, into Eastern Europe, and were the first purveyors of germ warfare. Uh, the Mongols were dying, they were attacking the city of Kaffa on the, on the Black Sea, and they started to catapult the dead bodies of victims over the walls of the city, and before you know it, the entire city was dead from bubonic plague. And so historians now believe that the, that the Mongols actually also communicated the Black Death into Europe and used it as a germ, warf germ warfare as they attacked some, some European cities. So for those of you that are interested in such things, I just give you that little gruesome tidbit, okay? Uh, some people question the church, okay, which taught Christians endure suffering while they uh, awaited rewards in heaven. In northern Italy, writers and artists began to express this view, uh, this new spirit of ex an experiment with different styles, okay? Specifically in art and writing. These men and women were greatly changed, uh, changed how Europeans saw themselves and their world, okay? About the middle of the 15th century, a series of events uh, which, which uh, transformed Europe, okay? The, the, these are the main events here that we're dealing with. The Turks, the Muslim Turks in 1453, which we've already mentioned briefly, captured the city of Constantinople. Okay, uh, This caused the flight of learned Greeks to the west. So when the Muslims sacked the city of Constantinople and take it over, those Greek Christians over there in the, in the Eastern uh, Empire begin to migrate to the west. And as they do, they're bringing with them what? Their, their affinity for Greek literature, Greek culture, uh, and, and that type of thing. So that they're bringing that with them uh, in the West as they flee from the, from the Turks. Okay? Uh, they, these carried with them the priceless manuscripts containing old Greek literature long forgotten in the darkened West. Now I mentioned to you already that one of the outcomes of the Crusades is the re or the rediscovery on the part of some in Europe to certain, uh, certain Greek and Roman literature that have been lost. When the, when the Turks sack Constantinople, there's a massive influx of people as they move west, and as they do that, they bring these things with them, okay? Now, I messed this up, so I'm going to go back here. This movement, 
that started in Italy sparked an explosion in creativity, art, writing, and thought that lasted from roughly 1300 to 1600. Historians call this period the Renaissance, a French word meaning rebirth. In, in this context, it refers to the revival of art and learning sparked by the rediscovery of classical literature. All right? Now, there are three main city-states in Italy. Now, there's a, there's a few reasons why it, this happens in Italy first. Number one, the bubonic plague hits Italy first. So because it hits Italy first, it runs its course through Italy while it's just entering into the, the, the rest of northern Europe. Okay? So Italy sort of is... It is done with the done facing the plague before the rest of Europe uh, happens. Now, there's other reasons too. The three main Italian city states of Milan, Florence, and Venice, okay, are where are going to be the force behind the early Renaissance. Each of these city states had strong ties to Byzantine and Muslim merchants. In addition, they all specialized in at least one commercial activity. Milan was famous for metal goods and armor. Florence was famous for banking and textiles, and Venice for Asian goods. So each one of these Italian city-states is, is uh, sort of specializing in one of those three areas there, which is causing them to gain as far as strength goes. Now, let's talk about Florence just for a minute. Florence is the most influential of the three. Of the three that we looked at there, Milan, uh, Florence, and Venice, Florence is the most important. Because it was dominated by the prominent Medici family. How many of you ever heard of the Medici? Okay, two of you. All right. Bankers. Yeah, they, they were at the time the wealthiest family in Europe. The Medici were. And in Florence, they dominated the banking industry. The Medici family, the Medici family bank showed insurance to sea traders to protect their overseas investments. In addition, the Medici set up numerous bank branches where they specialized in making loans and exchanging currencies. This influx of money in Italy allowed wealthy families to become patrons of the arts and is, a large, and is largely responsible for the artistic accomplishments by many Renaissance artists. So what happens is the Medici are wealthy, they, get, they, they start these banks and they get, basically, Italy starts rolling in the money as a result of this. Once that happens and the plague is over, a lot of people start to hire private artists to make them their own collections of artwork, and they become patrons of the arts. And it's from that that you have, quite frankly, the, some of the greatest art that's ever been produced in Western culture. You know, you have Michelangelo, Leonardo, Donatello, all the Ninja Turtles are making their artwork, okay, they're all making their artwork. Uh, Brunelleschi, other guys are building, I mean, this is the, the big explosion in art and architecture that comes out of this, and it's all being pumped up by this influx of wealth and money into Italy as a result of these, um, these Italian bankers and merchants, particularly the Medici in Florence, okay? So now people have, you know, look, before this, uh, before this happens, you didn't really care. If you're facing down the Black Death, you really care if you have your own art. No, you just want to live, right? So after these things run their course and certain historical events happen, the, this, this unfolds in Italy first, okay? Now, the, the spirit of the Renaissance. During the Renaissance, people became interested in ancient culture. Knowledge from ancient Greece and Rome that had, largely, that had been largely lost during the Middle Ages was rediscovered. Scholars thought that ancient Greek and Roman writings could help them solve contemporary problems. I kind of jumped the gun here, but Renaissance artists such as Donatello created statues that copied the Roman ideal of the human body. The, archi the architect Brunelleschi designed buildings after studying ruins in Rome. Using these rediscovered techniques, artists such as Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and Raphael created some of the most celebrated art that has ever been produced in Western culture. So as you get your notes, we're at the top of page two. <coughs> yeah, this, this is... This is really un, uh, unprecedented. This has never happened like this. I don't think it happened before, and I don't think it's happened since. 
Uh, Don, uh, Michelangelo, you know, obviously the Sistine Chapel, the, the, the David, the Pieta, all these things that he makes. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, this is where you get the idea of a Renaissance man, okay? Somebody who is, you know, good at a lot of different things, is, you know, is, is intelligent, is humorous, that, that whole Renaissance man concept. And Leonardo da Vinci really is sort of the, uh, the poster boy of that, that Renaissance man. He was an artist, a painter, an inventor. Uh, he did all sorts of things. If you study the, the work of uh, Da Vinci, which is not what we're going to do here, but I just mention it to you so you get the context of what's happening now uh, in the flow of, of history. This, the study of classical texts led to the creation of a new type of scholar, the humanist. Alistair McGrath explains how the Renaissance usage of the term humanist differs from its modern connotation. McGrath writes, the term humanist has now come to mean a worldview which denies the existence or relevance of God, but which is committed to uh, a purely secular outlook. This was not what the word meant at the time of the Renaissance. Most humanists of the period were religious and concerned to purify and renew Christianity rather than eliminate it. If you hear in modern terminology the term secular humanist or the term humanist, what is it referring to? It's usually referring to somebody that's atheistic, that believes in evolution, and that is a materialist, that man is the measure of all things and that there's nothing greater and so forth than humanity. That's not what it meant in the Renaissance. Okay, that, that, That's not what the term humanist meant in its original meaning and usage. McGrath also confesses that modern scholars have offered two different definitions from, for Renaissance humanism, stating... According to the first, humanism was a movement devoted to the study of classical languages and literature. According to the second, humanism was basically a set of ideas comprising the new philosophy of the Renaissance. So a humanist was somebody who studied Greek and Roman writers, artists, and so forth. Okay? And the spirit of the Renaissance is emerging here, which is going to drive this this whole thing and continue to make it uh, progress. It would be inaccurate to assume, based upon McGrath's writings, that all humanists were religious, though. Okay? An intellectual movement, as an intellectual movement, humanists focused on human potential and achievements. Rather than trying to make classical texts agree with Christian teachings, as medieval scholars had, the scholastics, we already talked about them, Humanists studied them to understand ancient Greek values. So, the level to which the Renaissance humanist is a Christian is going to vary. Okay? The point is, is that they are not totally abject denying anything regarding religion. Now, like they do today, if you hear the term humanist today. Okay? Um, in the Middle Ages, some people had demonstrated their piety... Some people demonstrated their piety by wearing rough clothing and eating plain foods. However, humanists suggest that a person might enjoy life without offending God. Most people remain devout Catholics. However, the basic spirit of the Renaissance society was secular, rather than spiritual and, con and concerned with the here and now. So what the humanists say is, you know, look... In the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church was, a, we've already studied this in great detail, how they dominated the thinking and, and life of the people, right? And the idea was that life is suffering now and there's eternal rewards in heaven. What the humanists are saying is, well, that doesn't mean you can't enjoy life now. That doesn't mean you can't have art. That doesn't mean you can't have a nice, nice building. That doesn't mean you can't have these things. And so the, the rediscovery of the ancient Greek and Roman writings... The emphasis on them for what's to stand alone created this new, this new mindset of the, of the Renaissance humanist. It is different, but it, it's not, like I say, it's not as extreme as a humanist is now in modern day, but it definitely is a movement away and a bit more of a secular worldview compared to what the Catholic Church had been teaching throughout the duration of the Middle Ages. Okay? Now, any questions about any of that? No? You'll see why this is important in a few minutes, hopefully.
Now I want you to look at the last point here. In terms of literature. Now if we're going to study church history, what's the most important piece of literature that we've been concerned with? The Bible. The Bible. Okay? So in terms of literature, Renaissance writers popularized the practice of writing in the vernacular or the native language of the people instead of Latin. Okay? So you have secular authors now, when they are composing their stories, their poems, their, what, their, their literature, they are no longer writing them in, in the Latin. They are now writing them in the vernacular. Now, what have we already seen in this class with Wycliffe and Huss? A stress on the translation of the Bible into what? Into vernacular, the language of the people. Now you have an entire intellectual movement that's gaining steam that is advocating for literature to be available and written in the vernacular language. Okay? So you're going to have a few phenomena here that are, that are sort of the snowballs rolling down the hill. And the church is going to really get plowed by the time this thing gets over with as far as their, their power and authority uh, that's going to change during the, the coming Reformation. So, the printing press changes the world. The Chinese invented block printing. In which a printer carved words or letters on a wooden block, inked the block, and then pressed it on paper. Around 1054, Bai Xing invented movable type, or a separate piece of type for each character in the language. The Chinese writing system contained thousands of different characters, so most Chinese printers found movable type impractical. However, the method would prove practical for Europeans because their languages have a, have a, ver have a very small number of letters in their alphabets. So, most Westerners think that Gutenberg did what? Invented the press. That's not true. The Chinese had all of the same components already, already known and in use for 400 years roughly before Gutenberg. What Gutenberg does is he streamlines the process and makes it more efficient. Okay? If you study world history, folks, one of the things you'll realize about um, Europeans is Europeans have a real knack for taking other people's ideas and improving them. Okay? Who invented gunpowder? The Chinese. The Chinese. Who turned gunpowder into a weapon and used it to dominate the world? The Western Europeans. Okay? The Mongols, the Mongols transferred that across into Europe. The Europeans got their hands on it and they took it. And, and, you know, it's really one of those fascinating things in history. There's a book out called, called Germs, Guns, and Steel that's about, about this, this topic. But once the Europeans got their hands on gunpowder, they then sail around Africa, come up the other side, and dominate the Chinese with gunpowder the Chinese invented. But the Chinese never took it and used it in the same, with the same application that the Europeans did. Okay. So the Chinese invent, the, invent all the working pieces of a press, but because their language is so huge, and you've seen Chinese, right? I mean, because of the nature of their language, a lot of it was not as practical as it was going to be for Europeans to use it. So during the 13th century, block printing items reached, reached Europe from China. European printers began using block printing to create whole pages to bind into books. However, the process was slow to satisfy the Renaissance demand for knowledge, information, and books. So you have two things here, okay? If there is no Renaissance, does Gutenberg improve this press? Probably not, okay? It would probably, he have, would have had no reason to, but because of the spirit of the Renaissance being what it was, there's a demand for stuff to be printed <coughs> in the academic languages, but also in the vernacular languages. Okay, so this is going to come here, and then around 1440, Johann Gutenberg, a craftsman in, in Mainz, Germany, developed a printing press that incorporated a number of technologies in a new way. So what he does is he takes, he takes the features of a Chinese press and he retools it, reworks it, re-outfits uh, re it to make it more efficient, and the process made it, quick, made it possible to produce book, uh, books quickly and cheaply. 
uh, using the improved process, Gutenberg printed a complete Bible, the Gutenberg Bible, in 1455, and it was the first full-size book printed with movable type. Okay? So, before we move on here with Gutenberg, are there any questions about that? The, if, by the way, this is not, this is in Latin. This is a Latin Bible. This is not a German Bible yet. The German Bible does not exist until Luther translates it in 1521. What's the text that's based on? Though? It's a Latin Vulgate text. The Vulgate. Yeah. I just think it's fascinating that here you have secular men coming up, prosperous and using ideas, but and it's, and it's playing out for evil, but God is using it for good too. Yeah, you know? Mm -hmm. like, the, like the press. I mean, goodness. That's one. I was going to say, so, oh, before the press, it took one scribe five months to make one book. With the press, one, uh, one press in five months, no, that's not right, one press in one month could make 500 books. Now you think about that, the only thing in my mind that rivals that type of explosion in information is the internet. Okay? The only thing that rivals this in world history is the invention of the internet in our day. But before, think about that, before that, it took five months for one scribe to make one book. Now on one press, in one month, it could spit out 500 books. Okay? Now, granted, not all of these are Bibles and so forth, but just the ability to do that is going to great. It's going to make books cheaper. It's going to make the people more literate. And before you know it, are people going to be screaming for a copy of the Bible that they can read themselves? Okay. So this is this idea that the, this invention coming together with the Renaissance is sort of one of these, you know. Opportune moments in history that are where all you got all the ingredients for something big to happen. Okay, now <coughs> that's a picture of of a Gutenberg press. The Gutenberg Bible was the most is the most beautiful piece of printing art ever produced, and the most valuable printed book in the world. Okay, hand bound hand bound in two volumes. There were six hundred forty eight pages in the first and six hundred thirty four in the second. An illuminator hand wrote the first letter of each chapter and the headings. Uh, today, 47 copies of the Gutenberg Bible are evidence to its enduring qual uh, quality. So there are still 47 documented known copies of a Gutenberg Bible in existence in modern time. Okay? Now, the printing press enabled a printer to produce hundreds of copies of a single work, and for the first time, books were cheap enough. For, so uh, cheap enough that many people could buy them, and at first printers produced mainly religious works. Okay, now and this is a this is a copy. This is a, a printed page from a Gutenberg Bible. Okay, you can see the ornate, you know, decorations and stuff like that that are, that are on each one of these pages. There's color inks on some of these pages. So these are, you know, if you had one of these, you know, you could sell it and go live somewhere and really not have to worry about anything else the rest of your life. Yeah. Was the artwork also on the printing press or was that hand done? Some of it, I think it was hand done later. And not all of them are probably this ornately decorated, but I just want to give you an example, at least in part of what we're, what we're talking about here. Now, the one thing about Gutenberg, though, is he was a good tinker and a good inventor, but he was a lousy businessman. Okay. Due to unsound business practices and mounting debt, how, whatever, however much that uh, 2,026 guilders amounts to, I have no idea, but um, John Fust, an inventor, repossessed, an investor, I'm sorry, repossessed the press, Bibles, and shop. According to Donald L. Brake, author of the Visual History of the English Bible, after, one, after 1457, no printed document can be attributed to Gutenberg. Fust and Scoffer, however, both gained immediate international fame as printers, 
But eventually Gutenberg, by virtue of his association with the famous Gutenberg Bible, would be remembered as the greatest printer of all time. But the fact is, he really wasn't. Okay? We remember him that way, history remembers him that way, but if you look at the facts of history, he really, after, after the things invented in um, 1455, the Gutenberg Bible was printed, by two years later, he's been totally disassociated with his press because of his debts, and his investors repossess it from him. Okay? Had, but had he not done what he did, plus and Schaffer would have been able to do it. Yeah, they, they wouldn't be able to get rich off so of it. So still he's the greatest. So he's the, yeah, I mean, in that sense. In that sense, yeah. Gutenberg, destitute and forgotten, died February 3rd, 1468, in his native uh, meets. By 1500, a mere 30 years after his death, Bibles from printing presses were found in 17 European countries. Towns with presses grew to 260, and there were 1,120 printing offices. Almost 40,000 different works in various editions, totaling more than 10 million copies, had flooded the market. Clearly, Gutenberg had an impact. Okay? So you look at the statistics and the historical facts, and it, it's, it's very, very plain to see the, um, the importance of Gutenberg. Johann Gutenberg's careful attention to detail and technical achievement, and his desire to print an accurate and complete text, guaranteed his success. Gutenberg's contribution to the printing made him Time Magazine's Man of the Millennium. The message of God's work in Latin, and within a few years in other languages too, and the, and the format for its printing made the Bible's availability possible for all. You can't have your own copy if it takes a scribe five months to make one book. A, it's too slow. B, it's too expensive. The, the, the handwritten product. So that's why this invention here is such a, a, a big deal for the Reformation that's going to come. Because I already told you, Luther's going to go up to the door of the church, he's going to nail the 95 theses to the door, and what's somebody going to do? Take them down, bring them over to a press, print 10,000 of them, and everybody in Germany reads the thing. Okay? But you can't have that if you don't have this first. You guys following that? So Luther is every bit a product of the timing of his age. Okay? Now, any questions about any of that before we move on to the next point? I just wonder, like in the Dark Ages, perhaps brilliant men that were in there, there too, but they just, you know, a product of their age. They just lived and died. Well, even the Wycliffe Bible. Well, that all had to be hand copied. Right. It was all hand copied. The fact that there are so many, just a second, the fact that there are so many of those that survive is astounding. I think I told you there were more than 200 of them that are documented to still exist, copies of the Wycliffe Bible. Just a little factoid about the 95 theses on the door. That was standard protocol for putting up your like agenda or whatever of what you wanted to discuss with the rest of the guys. He wasn't the only person nailing right. stuff on that wall. He, that was common practice in that day. That was how you got the attention of the scholarly world was to do something like that. Okay, and that's why the Catholic Church for a while, for at, at first were like, this is just some this is this is just another ticked off priest. And they didn't really pay much attention to it until they circulated all over Germany in in uh, in German. And then he writes five tracks. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll talk about this next week. But then he writes five tracks or pamphlets in German. And then he really makes the church mad. And then those 95 pieces, aren't they just the uh, correction, like for indulgences? They're basically his objection to the sale of indulgences. Yeah, yeah. Which... Catholic Church probably could have looked at it, honestly. So this is the right. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk more about that next week. Okay. Any other comments about the Renaissance, the spirit of the Renaissance, or the printing press before we go to Erasmus? The only thing I think is that sometimes we think, who would say that? My son-in-law is weeping. They think that the old, these people um, in the past history are so dumb. 
it's like when we're talking with Raphael, you know, how you got something new. I just, it's not new. And they just don't have that, you know, that, and I think, well, I wish you'd sit in your class. <laughs> well, that's, that's why, you know, I think that's why a class like this, while we're in, now, while we're not directly, we left the direct study of the scripture a while ago. But you have to know, it, it seems to me that it benefits every believer to know this stuff. Mm -hmm. Because it just helps you understand what happened and how we got to us. Okay? Now, Erasmus and the Textus Receptus. Alistair McGrath, author of Christian Theology, discusses how the Northern Renaissance took a more religious tone than the Italian Renaissance. Now, I want to say this. The Renaissance is later in coming to the north to Northern Europe. And the reason for that is the plague. Okay? The plague hits Italy first. It spreads through Italy and then into France and England and, and the northern the northern areas of Germany and, and so forth. And so because it comes later, it lingers longer. And so the Renaissance is going to take a while to spread up into northern up into the northern areas of Europe. Okay? So McGrath states, although there are major variations within the northern northern European humanism, two ideals seem to have achieved widespread acceptance throughout the movement. First, we find the same concern for written and spoken eloquence after the fashion of the classical period as in the Italian Reformation, it says. Don't get confused there, that he just means Renaissance. Second, we find a religious program directed towards the corporate revival of the Christian church. The Latin slogan, Christmas uh, Recensus, Christianity being be born again, summarized the aims of the program. So here's the deal, okay? The Southern Renaissance, the Southern Renaissance is more secular. The Northern Renaissance is going to be more, what? More religiously minded, okay? They're going to be about a lot of the same things, but the focus of them is not going to be exactly the same. Okay, and even within the Northern Renaissance, that doesn't mean that you're going to have no 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 one's interested in secular things and vice versa. Okay, they just it's just a general observation of the nature of the Renaissance in these particular areas. Okay, McGrath states. <coughs> I already read that. Next next point. Uh, <coughs> Erasmus of Rotterdam is, is generally regarded as the most important humanist writer of the Renaissance and had a profound impact upon Christian theology during the first half of the 16th century. Although not a Protestant in any sense of the term, Erasmus did much to lay the intellectual foundations of the Reformation. It's commonly said, folks, that Erasmus laid the egg and Luther hatched it. Okay? According to the entry uh, on Erasmus in the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, Erasmus was educated at Devonshire by the, by the Brethren of the Common Life. He spent six years as a monk and then attended co the College of De uh, Montague in Paris. In 1499, he visited England where he met John Colette and Thomas More. This experience influenced him <coughs> to employ literary talent, intellectual brilliance, and a clever wit in the service of Christ. Now, the following is a summary here, and I know it's small on there, but you have it in your notes, okay, of the life and career of Erasmus. So I kind of broke this down into his location because Erasmus is a, is a widely traveled man, okay? From Paris, in 1500, he writes, uh, Aegis, or Aegis, an annotated collection of classical proverbs was published. In 1503, he writes a handbook of practical theology as well as editions of Cicero and Jerome, both Romans, okay? And a critical edition and annotated testament of the, of the uh, sorry, and a critical edition of the annota annotation of the New Testament by Lorenzo Valle. So a lot of that stuff is really not religiously minded necessarily at all that he's publishing. In England, then, in 1505, he's going to begin his translation of the New Testament. In 1506, he's going to, uh, he traveled to Italy and experienced direct contact with the humanist culture of, of Italy. In 1509, Erasmus went back to England where he, where he finished and published Praise of Folly. 
which we'll talk about more in a second. And then between 1509 and 1516, when his Greek edition of the New Testament was published, Erasmus traveled all over Europe studying Greek manuscripts. However, it was also during this time period that the classical editions of Jerome, Seneca, Plutarch, and Cato were published. And lastly, it was during these years <coughs> that the education of the Christian prince was printed. So he's going, he is, by all accounts, the foremost scholar of the age. Okay? He, had, he is traveling all through Europe. He's access to all the libraries. As he travels, he is reviewing Greek manuscripts. He is looking at things, and while he's writing some of these other things, all right? And a lot of Erasmus' writings really don't have anything to do with Christianity. They have to do, if you look at Seneca, Plutarch, Cato, and Jerome, a lot of those guys are classical Roman thinkers, writers, authors, and stuff like that that don't really have anything to do with the church or Christianity at all. So Erasmus is sort of an interesting guy. He embodies the spirit of the Renaissance, and then he's definitely focused on you know, uh, secular things from classical culture, but he also has this religious bent to him where he's interested in the Greek New Testament and compiling it and so forth and writing some things also that relate to, to, to Christianity. Okay? Any questions about that? Erasmus was a prolific writer, and each main category of his works <coughs> reveals something of his personality. First, he produced many scholarly books, including historical material, lexicons, translations, and critical editions of earlier books. His purpose was to combat ignorance, and he believed truth was attainable through clarity of expression. All right? A second element of his approach is revealed in his satirical, sat, satirical works, such as Praise of Folly. Here, Erasmus ridicules humanists and scholars who take themselves too seriously, but he saves his most, but, most biting satire for bigoted churchmen, pompous lawyers, and, whoremonger, and warmongering rulers. He really... That, he, while he is never, while he is always technically a Catholic, he definitely has a lot of uh, things to say, a lot of satirical jabs at the church that he makes in some of his writings. Okay. The final category of his work, the more overtly Christian writings, demonstrates that neither scholarship nor humor was an end in itself. These elements were profuse to reach the goal of the restoration of primitive Christianity. Erasmus felt called to cleanse and purify the church through the application of humanistic scholarship to Christian tradition. So he definitely thinks that there's problems in the church. Okay? He makes no attempt to break from the church, but he definitely feels that the church needs to be cleaned up a little bit. Okay, is, is probably the best way of viewing it. Now, according to Alistair McGrath, Handbook of a Christian Soldier was the landmark was a landmark in religious publishing. Although the work was first printed in 1503 <coughs> and then reprinted in 1509, its real impact dates from the third printing in 1515. From the moment, from that moment onward, it became a cult work, apparently going through 23 editions in the next six years. Its appeal was to educated laymen and women whom Erasmus regarded as the most important resource that the church possessed. So his target audience is the educated person who's not in the church. Okay? Who's not a priest who's not a bishop, who's not a member of the Catholic structure or hierarchy, that is who he is viewing as the most untapped resource that the church has in its possession. And so that's kind of his <coughs> target audience. Now, the handbook of the Christian soldier developed the revolutionary thesis that the church of the day could be reformed by a collective return to the writings of the fathers and scripture. The regular reading of Scripture is put forward as the key to a new lay piety on the basis of which the church may be renewed and reformed. 
Erasmus does not understand Christianity to be a mere external observance of a moral code. His classic, his characteristically humanist emphasis upon the inner religion led him to suggest that reading the scripture transforms its readers, giving them a new motivation to love, to love God and their neighbors. Now, clearly is Erasmus upset with what he sees in the church. Yes. Okay. So he is calling for there to be a reform. All right. Now, whether or not I feel that reform is totally appropriate as far as what he's suggesting, some of I cannot argue with with some of the things that he's saying here about what's necessary. Okay. I of course would favor a return to scripture, not a return to the church fathers, because it's the church fathers that got them in the mess they were in. Okay. <coughs> but the point here is. Is you can't you can't rightly call Erasmus a Protestant, but you can't rightly call him a card carrying Catholic either. Okay, so he's an interesting guy, and in that he kind of fits somewhere in the middle. Now, E. H. Broadbent, author of the Pilgrim Church, highlights the single biggest outcome of the Renaissance humanist interest in classical literature as the restoration and publication of the text of the Greek New Testament. Up until now, up until Erasmus, the only thing going in Western Christendom was what? The Latin Vulgate. Okay? Erasmus, through his textual study and travel, is going to uncover a different text than what had been used by the Catholics for over a thousand years. Okay? And that is what he is going to publish in the first edition of his Textus Receptus, or the Received Text. So that's what we're going to look at now. The first printed Greek New Testament was printed, was published by Erasmus in 1516. McGrath, who by the way I should say, tell you, was a supporter of the New Bibles, he was involved in the translation of the NIV, uh, reports that Erasmus had access, had access to a mere four manuscripts for most of the New Testament, and only one for the final part, the book of Revelation. As it happened, the manuscript left out five verses, which Erasmus himself had to translate into Greek from the Latin Vulgate. Nevertheless, it proved to be a literary milestone. For the first time, theologians had an opportunity of comparing the original Greek text of the New Testament with the latter Vulgate translation in the Latin. Now, I have a few things to say about that. We'll get to those in a second. When Erasmus came to Basley, or Basel, I'm sorry, in July 1515 to begin his work, he found five Greek New Testament manuscripts ready for his use. These are now designated by the following numbers. Okay, Now, don't get confused by the numbers. Number one is an 11th century manuscript of the Gospels, Acts, and the Epistles. Manuscript number two, a 15th century manuscript of the Gospels. Manuscript 2 AP, a 14th through 12th through 14th century manuscript of Acts and the Epistles. 4 AP, a 15th century manuscript of Acts and the Epistles. And I, or 1 R, a 12th century manuscript of Revelation. Now this is important. Of the manuscripts Erasmus used, 1 and A4 only occasionally. In the Gospels, Acts, and the Epistles, his main reliance was on A, was on 2 and 2 AP. Now, the big question then is, a modern scholar is going to come and say, well, you see, he only had four or five manuscripts that he was using, and he was using a wrong set of texts, and blah, 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 on down the line. Okay? But here's the key point that you need to understand. Did Erasmus use other manuscripts besides the five in preparing his Textus Receptus? The indications are that he did. <coughs> it was well known also that Erasmus looked for manuscripts <coughs> everywhere during his travels and that he borrowed them from everyone he could. Hence, although the Texas Receptus was based mainly on the manuscripts that Erasmus found at Bessel, it, is also include, it also included readings taken from others which he had access, to which he had access. It agreed with the common faith because it found it was founded on manuscripts which in the providence of God were readily available. Okay? Now, you have to understand, 
The texts that Erasmus is using to compile his Greek New Testament, are they different from that Vulgate? Yes. Yes. That Vulgate has different readings in it than the one Erasmus is using. Now we've been through this a lot, right? How there are fundamentally two different Bibles. That the, all the new Bibles are coming from a, a different underlying fundamental Greek text than the King James. The King James, the, the, the German Bible that Luther translates, the King James, Tyndale, and all those early English translations before the King James, with the exception of Wycliffe, are going to come from the Textus Receptus Greek text that Erasmus is compiling. Okay? Now, think about who is Erasmus. Erasmus is a humanist scholar who's, who's very interested in Greek and Roman literature. And so one of the things that he does as a humanist scholar is he compiles a Greek text of the New Testament based on his access and, and understanding of the available Greek manuscripts that he had. Okay? You guys following me with this? You understand what I'm saying here? Okay? Though his study of the through his study of the writings of Jerome and other church fathers, Erasmus became very well informed concerning the variant readings of the New Testament text. Indeed, almost all the important variant readings known to scholars today were already known to Erasmus more than 460 years ago and discussed in the notes which he placed after the text in his editions of the Greek New Testament. Here, for example, Erasmus dealt with such problem passages as the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6.13, the interview of the rich young man with Jesus, uh, Matthew 19.17-22, the ending of Mark, the disputed ending of the book of Mark in chapter 16, the angelic song in Luke 22, the woman taken in adultery in John 7, and the mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy. So all of the disputed passages, or not all of them, a vast majority of them, Erasmus was already familiar with the variant readings of those passages when he published his Greek New Testament in 1516. Okay? Questions? In his notes, Erasmus placed before the reader not only the ancient discussions concerning the New Testament text, but also debates which took, uh, which took place in the early church over the New Testament canon and the authorship of some of the New Testament books, especially Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, Jude, and Revelation. Not only did he mention the doubts reported by Jerome and other church fathers, but he also added some objections of his own. <coughs> however, he dis however, he discussed these matters somewhat warily, declaring himself willing at any time to submit to the consensus of public opinion, and especially to the authority of the church. So there's where he's not quite willing to stick his neck out that far. Okay? But, between the years 1516 and 1535, Erasmus published five editions of the, New of the Greek New Testament. The first edition, 1516, the text was... <coughs> Proceeded by a dedication to Pope Leo X, an exhortation to the reader and the discussion of the method used in a defense of his method. Then came the Greek New Testament text, accompanied by Erasmus's own Latin translation, and then this was followed by Erasmus's notes, gaining him com uh, sorry, uh, giving his comments on the text. In the second edition, Erasmus revised both the Greek text and his own Latin translation. In the third edition, 1522, is chiefly remarkable for the inclusion of 1 John 5, 7. You know, the Joachim comma about there are three that bear record in heaven, right? Rasmus said if he could find it, if somebody could show it to him in one Greek manuscript, he would include it. Okay? So, uh, in the fourth edition, 15, 1527, contained a Greek, the, uh, the Greek text, the Latin Vulgate, and Erasmus's Latin translation in three parallel columns. The fifth edition in 1535 omitted the Vulgate. Ooh, that decision to omit the Vulgate. Thus, resuming the practice of printing the Greek text and the version of Erasmus side by side. Now, i got to tell you that 
It was scandalous for Erasmus to make his own translation of the Latin. Because when he does that, he's saying that Jerome was wrong, and the church hasn't had it right for the last 1,200 years. Okay? So Erasmus is a wily cat here. He sort of is coming and going and just doing enough slippery things to make an impact but not go too far. Okay? You guys following that? Mm -hmm. The Gallic Church uses the day Jerome's text, or they wouldn't use Erasmus, right? No. It's Jerome's. That's why if you look at the Lord's Prayer in a modern translation and compare it with a Roman Catholic Bible, they read the exact same. Because they're taken from a manuscript that... So, the Vulgate is essentially a modern Bible. Because it's it's taken from manuscripts that Jerome used to translate the Vulgate. So, the Vaticanus manuscript, which was found where? Vatican. In the Vatican, is a Roman Catholic manuscript. No, no Bible-believing person of the ages that we've studied ever touched, handled, translated, died for that manuscript. It was locked in the Vatican Library, and, and I, don't, I don't even think to this day that any Protestant has ever handled it with their own hands or read it with their own eyes. The church has released photostatic reprints of it, but I don't think any Protestants have been allowed in there to look at it. Yeah. They just said something on the news or the Vatican where they had released one page. Someone was holding it, and I was trying to remember if he even had gloves on. had holes in it. It was supposed to be one of the oldest... You know, and so <coughs> they're letting out tiny tidbits here. Right. <laughs> the or the text of or now think back with me through the class. The text of origin, Eusebius, Constantine, and Jerome. The NA, the New American Standard, the NIV, the, uh, the the American Standard in modern form was the official book of the Dark Age popes. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm not trying to be funny. No. I'm, I'm being very serious. <coughs> it was the it was the, it was official for the church that has dominated our study of church history between 500 and 1500. Ruckman asserts that the Dark Ages began with the adoption of this text, which is an interesting interpretation, by the way, to consider. In addition, there is no recovery from the blackout of the Middle Ages until the text of Jerome was replaced by the Byzantine, Antioch, and Syrian text of the Waldensians, St. Patrick, and the Albigensians. All of Europe was unified during the Crusades, but the blackout continued, and it was not until local assemblies and the majority of Christian scholars abandoned this text that the revival came. Okay? Erasmus's Greek text is the underlying manuscript witness? Okay, let me start over. Erasmus's Greek text is the underlying manuscript witness, and, and its underlying manuscript witnesses is the text that the Catholic Church has never approved of. For this was the text of the Paulicians, the Bogomils, the Cathari, the Waldensians. This is the text that they died for. Okay. Now look at. I am saying to you. That the Reformation does not happen without what is driving the Reformation. One of the things that is driving the Reformation is the production of that Greek text and its translation into the vernacular language. Okay? You don't have the Reformation, you don't have these things until this occurs. And look at where the church is now. I'm telling you, I, I, I was given an assignment for the May conference down there in Ohio. I got to preach four messages related to the King James Bible, and one of them is on the cultural impact of the King James Bible on English speaking people. So I went to the bookstore and I, 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 I bought like five books on this, and I'm reading all of these books, and I'm reading this thing, and the guy in the book is talking about how, well, you know, the King James. They, they, they used the best text that they had available to them, the translators of the King James at the time, but we now have. 
better manuscripts and older manuscripts, and he's going on down through the line. But then he says, and it's clear that the current state of, of, of Christian illiteracy within the church coincides with the replacement of the King James Bible as the standard English text. I'm like, are you kidding me? You just said what I've been saying for... Th for I've been saying it for 30 years because I'm only 33 years old. But for the last 10 years. <laughs> okay? But there's a guy, and he, he, he admits on there that the, the, the spiritual literacy of, the Christian, of Christianity in the body of Christ is less now than it was before that before the new Bibles replaced the King James Bible as a standard English text, but then he turns around and promotes the new Bibles and says, yeah, those are the ones you should use. And so the 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 they were as we go in time, how many of you think the church is better off now than it was a hundred years ago? Or in more light or more understanding than it was a hundred years ago? Well, when was the market flooded with all these new modern translations? 1881. So you see, folks, that just as there was a recovery of truth that happened when Erasmus produces this text, and that text is translated into English, and boom, you have the in English and German, and boom, you have the Reformation. You almost have a, a D Reformation as a result of that text being supplant, supplanted again by the text of the Dark Ages. And I know, again, somebody's going to watch this. I've got friends of mine who are going to say, you're being uh, this, that, or the other thing. Okay, fine. But I, 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 can't, I cannot get past these points as fundamental points to what's happened in church history. Okay? Despite the odds, the text of Erasmus with slight revision by Stephanus Elzever and Beza, who, who take they take the text of Erasmus, and as more manuscripts are uncovered, they make some slight revisions to what Erasmus originally did, okay? But it's all still the same text, <coughs> was translated into sixteen hundred languages, with one billion copies of it in English alone. I was reading a book this week down in Florida, and it said that there are that there are two by two King James Bibles in English for every person in the world to have one. That's that's a staggering statistic. The English transla the English translation built the British Empire and the Republic of America. And it, and it determined the thinking of the founding fathers of the United States when they framed the Constitution. It also brought about the evangelical conversion of over 40 million sinners to Jesus Christ under the ministries of Luther, Calvin, Knox, Beza, Wesley, Edwards, Whitefield, Torrey, Moody, Sunday, Finney, Spurgeon, Schofield, and scores of others. What Bible were all those guys preaching from? Okay? Now... <clears throat> Erasmus reached the height of his fame at the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. At first, he encouraged Luther. But, about, but after the Leipzig debate, he began to criticize him. He finally publicly broke with Luther in his diatribe on free will in 1524. Okay? Did he agree with Luther on the... At first he did. Okay? Yeah. Do you think that because he was so knowledgeable in secular writings also that that influenced his kind of on-the-fence um, attitude toward all this? I, don't, I, could, I can't say yes or no to that, but I do think Erasmus had a shrewdness about him, where he knew. I mean, think about think about he he puts out a, the first edition of his Greek text as a dedication to the Pope. In it. And you think about that. What is that other than, for lack of a better term, him brown nosing or kissing up to the Pope? 
But yet, he got away with it. And then he revises it and so forth, and, and uh, it goes into other editions. And then the, the 1521 edition is the one that Luther uses to translate the German Bible. Yeah. Whenever I think about Erasmus, the, there's this little quote that Luther wrote in a tract or something to Erasmus, and I can't quote it, I have it written down at home, but the basic gist of it is that, the, that Luther believed that the difference of their points of view was that Erasmus wanted to subject his knowledge to the authority of the church, and Luther argued, what authority does the church have except for the scripture? With the, uh, everything is scripture. I, I think that would be a very good way of looking at the differences between the two of them. And even Luther, when he starts, Luther, when Luther starts, does he intend to make a whole new church? No. No. He intends to. He wants to reform it. So his initial, and that's where the rub comes between him and Erasmus. As Luther goes further and further, he becomes more and more overtly anti-church. And that's where these two guys are going to kind of break from each other. But initially, Erasmus supported Luther in what he was doing. So that Erasmus was Catholic all his life, probably by Catholic. Yeah, I have no way of knowing whether or not Erasmus it was a saved man or not. I can't. You like to think that he was, but I can't say for sure because I have found nothing where you can clearly that clearly gives testimony to what Erasmus was believing for his eternal salvation. Okay? Alright, any other questions or comments? So tomorrow, or tomorrow, next week, we'll start the Reformation with Luther. And then two weeks from today, we're going to have our breakfast for Easter, so we won't have class in two weeks. Thanks for your attention. What did you say? I'm sorry, we're not going to have class this week? On Easter. Oh, okay.